Hey everyone, um, this lecture we're going to be talking about um, pediatric illnesses. Specifically, we're going to be discussing the illnesses associated with the respiratory and the GI tract. All right, so the differences in the respiratory system, let's talk a little bit about adults versus pediatrics. So we've already been there, done that when we're looking at um, respiratory conditions, uh, COPD, uh, you know, pneumonia, bronchitis, chronic emphysema, all of those things that you guys have already learned about. Um, let's talk a little bit about the differences between the adults and the peds that the nurse needs to be aware of regarding the respiratory system in the pediatric client. So a child's upper airway is much shorter and narrower than it is in the adults. The child's larynx is more flexible and easily stimulated to spasm, making them a lot more vulnerable to bronchospasm um, than we would in the adults, which is why we get worried about some kind of an infectious or an allergic reaction that can cause that bronchospasm. Um, the child's metabolic rate is higher, creating a higher O2 demand, right? So newborns, use four to eight liters of oxygen per minute versus the adults, which use three to four liters per minute of oxygen. So requiring them a much higher O2 demand. Okay, so especially think about all the things that we learned about with um, in the newborn lecture when we talk about the thermal regulation and how it affects um, the respiratory system and the newborn transition right at birth because they have such higher O2 demands than we do in the adults. Um, infants have 25 million alveoli at birth. 25 million. Sounds like a lot, but by three years it increases to 200 to 300 million, um, which is what we see within adulthood. So 25 million alveoli at birth versus the 300 million that we're, we have by adulthood. Um, the AP diameter, remember we learned about the anterior, anterior posterior diameter um, is going to be equal, but it then decreases with age to a two to one ratio. So remember the anterior posterior diameter is two to one. It's actually equal when it, it, you look at the the pediatrics. So they, they're going to have an equal, a one-to-one -one AP diameter, making that um, physical assessment that's going to be differing from what, what you do with the adults. So I have co cultural competence here. Um, so a little bit of cultural competence when we're assessing the respiratory system, um, especially when we're assessing color, because color plays such a big role in the um, oxygenation and how they're perfusing. You know, we look at, are they blue? Are they cyanotic? Um, they can kind of have that dusky color. So in darker skinned infants, erythema, any kind of redness, uh, will appear violet or a dusky red, whereas cyanosis will appear black. Uh, jaundice will appear darker than their normal skin color. So what we can do um, to assess for that is imprint the bridge of the nose and the chin to assess for any kind of a yellowing discoloration. All right, we're gonna talk about upper respiratory tract disorders. So now I'm going to differentiate. Um, we're gonna break it down, the respiratory system. We're gonna break it down between upper respiratory tract disorders and then lower respiratory tract disorders. So for this slide, let's talk about the upper respiratory tract disorders. So a couple of um, diseases here. We've got um, coanal atresia, acute nasopharyngitis, pharyngitis, epistaxis, and then congenital laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia. So let's start with the coanal atresia. So this is where we've got a congenital obstruction to the nares. Um, which is almost immediately seen at birth, um, we're going to see the newborn having respiratory distress. Remember we talked about with the newborn that they're obligatory nose breathers. Well, if they don't have the ability, they don't have a patent nasal airway, um, they've got the, that obstruction to the nares, you're going to see immediate respiratory distress at birth. 
Um, so some things that we talked about with the new board assessment is that nasal patency test, right? Where we occlude one there and test for the patency or any kind of struggling ability to breathe through that one there. Um, so this is why it's so specifically important that we're going to want to be doing this. Okay. So how we treat this is piercing the obstructed membrane um, that is obstructed on that one side, or if it's a bony growth that is obstructing the airway, surgically removing that bony growth. Okay. So some nursing interventions, some of the things that we need to be doing, um, whether it's pre or post treatment is monitoring them um, for fatigue, especially during feeds. Remember we said that with breastfeeding and bottle feeding, they're going to be breathing through their nose. So we want to look for any kind of fatigue. If they're not, if they're too tired to be eating because it's just taking too much out of them, I want you to think of it in terms of your um, COPD or that has that activity intolerance specifically with feeds. It's the same concept with these babies. What happens is they're not going to get enough nutrition but with the babies specifically, they're not going to be getting those fluids and um, they're not going to be getting hydration. So they're going to get dehydrated really fast and then everything is going to start to tank. So we need to be monitoring feeds for some those fatigue. Acute nasal pharyngitis. This is exactly the common cold, right? So we all know what the common cold resembles. Um, clinically, they're going to have watery eyes, rhinitis, congestion. They can have a low-grade fever. Um, how we treat this is Tylenol for a fever. Um, just make sure we don't give them any aspirin. Um, no aspirin to the kids less than 18 years of age. Um, the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, doesn't recommend any cough or cold medicines to be given. Um, so it's not within the recommendations. You know, you see a lot of that with um, over-the-counter. You just want to tell parents um, to be cautious when using that because it isn't suggested right now from the AAP. It's not within guidelines. But what we can use, like we said, the Tylenol for fevers. Um, and we can also use um, humidifications at home, like a humidifier. Uh, but if parents are going to go along the route of humidifiers, you need to educate them regarding proper cleaning of it. Um, some They tend to forget how, um, how to clean it or that the fact that it needs to be clean. And then we're just adding more insult to the injury there with um, harboring bacteria and then spreading it within the environment. Um, and you also want to educate them regarding whole, cold versus hot humidification. Hot humidification um, can really pose as an injury risk, um, especially if it, it you know, go uh, spills on top of the child. Um, so with that, you just really want to emphasize that. All right, pharyngitis. Um, this is where you've got infection and inflammation of the throat. This can either be viral or bacterial. So let's talk about the viral pharyngitis. Clinically, what you see with viral pharyngitis is they're going to have a sore red throat. Um, they're going to have rhinorrhea, right? So that runny nose. Bacterial, it's going to be your strep, right? So we're going to do a swab and we're going to find the strep organism. Um, the, the bacterial is more severe and they present kind of suddenly compared to viral, which is kind of brought on gradually. Um, so with your bacterial, such as strep, you're going to have more severe symptoms and they're going to be sick like within a snap. Like overnight, they're going to wake up with the high fever, sore throat, um, stomach ache. And they can have bright red tonsils with the strep. They can also present with some petechiae on the palate. So those little pinpoint uh, purple, uh, almost like purplish pinpoints um, on the, the palate. And they can have a sandpaper-like rash. Um, so it can be on their hands, um, on their feet, um, on their cheeks. They can have the sandpaper-like rash as well as the fever. And like I said, the stomach ache too. Um, so we how, how we diagnose this is the rapid antigen strep test. So the swab. And how we're going to treat it once we've ruled out that it is bacterial. Um, antibiotics and supportive treatment. So when I say supportive treatment, I mean your um, nose spray, Tylenol, um, you know, uh, warm, cool compresses for the fever. Um, we want to emphasize and really stress the importance of education when it comes with parents. With bacterial, if it's left untreated, this can lead to rheumatic fever, 
and glomerular nephritis. Okay, so rheumatic free fever and glomerular nephritis is what the complication resulting from the strep virus um, can have. So we want to be sure that if it is bacterial, that we need to be getting them dosed with antibiotics and they need to be finishing the course of treatment with that. This isn't something that we want to just let the immune system ride out, okay? Um, think about the complications um, left untreated. Retropharyngeal abscess. Um, this is where they've got a, an abscess that is going to drain into their nasal pharynx. Okay, so this abscess um, with draining causes them to have a high fever, causes them to not want to eat, um, and what we see is drooling, drooling of the mouth, because they can't swallow past the obstruction. Um, so they have drooling of secretions and also a snoring sound with respirations. So with their breathing, they're going to have like a snoring sound while they're awake. Okay, so treatment for this is also going to be IV antibiotics, IV, notice I said the IV, so we want to admit them, um, get on board some IV antibiotics as well as some IV fluids for hydration, and we want to be monitoring their respiratory status with this. Epistaxis, I think we all know what a nosebleed is, right? Um, whether it's for whatever reason that they're getting the nosebleed, um, we want to keep them in an upright position with their head, head tilted slightly forward, not back, okay? It's so one of the common misconceptions is, and you see it in movies all the time, where they go back like that. We don't want them to go back like that because we don't want it to drain into the lungs. So we want them to be in an upright position with the head tilted slightly forward and apply pressure for about 10 minutes, okay? Um, congenital laryngomalacia, so what this is, um, the infant's larynx structure is weaker and the tissue cartilage is kind of like soft and floppy, um, collapsing in and on itself, which then is obstructing through the upper airway. So when what you see with these kids that have a laryngomalacia uh, is they have that in inspiratory strider. So this is really where you're going to hear that stridery sound. Not to be confused with croup, which we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, but they have a significant sound to them with this um, laryngomalacia. It's called like a crowing sound with respirations. So with breathing, breathing they have this stridery crowing sound with respirations. And um, because it's congenital, you know, and it has to do with the structure of the cartilage, they usually will outgrow this by two years, okay? So we want to just be teaching the parents, um, teaching them to uh, monitor for the respiratory sy symptoms um, as well as the same with the coinal atresia, monitoring their feeds, okay? Monitoring their feeds for any fatigue. So small frequent feeds to help prevent the fatigue to make sure that they're meeting their caloric requirements and they're not getting too respiratory distressed. Okay, so I was just talking about the laryngomalacia and having a kind of a significant sound, like the crowing sound or the strider heard on respirations. Um, now we're going to talk about croup, laryngotracheobronchitis, which is literally what it says in the name, inflammation of the larynx, the trachea, and the major bronchi. So remember, with the respiratory system, you've got your, your major bronchi or bronchus as well as that kind of stems and feeds into the bronchioles, which is the smaller airways. With croup, this is inflammation of all of those airways there, the larynx, the trachea, and the major bronchi. This usually occurs um, with kids that are about six months of age to, to about three years of age, give or take a little bit. Some kids that may have um, repeated episodes of croup in their younger years, they may not grow out of it right away at three years of age. It may extend into kind of the elementary years. Um, but what this is caused by is most commonly a viral infection, most commonly caused by the H influenza, um, which we all know what the influenza is. However, we've seen a drastic decline in croup with kids since we started administering the flu vaccines. Um, 
So clinical manifestations with this, they typically start out with having mild upper respiratory infection sy symptoms. Okay, so just some mild upper respiratory infection, mild calm and cold like um, symptoms. And then upon going to bed, the child, um, the child will go to bed having a normal to a mildly elevated temperature. So they may have a normal or maybe kind of a, a low grade fever on going to bed. And then suddenly they wake up in the middle of the night with this significant classic croupy cough, also known as the barking cough. Um, so they sound like little seals. I know the other one I said they sound like crows. These actually, they sound like seals. It's a, a barking cough. It's that inspiratory strider that's coupled with marked substernal retractions. Okay, we don't really see substernal retractions with the other one, but with these kids, upon inspiratory um, strider, you'll hear the strider, which is audible without a stethoscope, and you'll also see the substernal right in the middle of their chest retractions, which they kind of wake up to this extreme respiratory distress. And it can be extremely significantly terrifying to the parents. So a lot of education is going to be involved with this. Um, so some therapeutic management, a lot of it is going to be education. Um, what we can do is parents can run a warm mist shower um, with the steam. So literally sit in a nice, hot, steamy, steamy room um, and then keep the child in a warm environment when they're having a spasm like that. Um, if this doesn't relieve the symptoms or if the symptoms worsen, um, then we can we want to tell them to bring the child to the ER. So another thing that we can do too, and I know it sounds completely contradictory, but if a warm, steamy shower doesn't work, another thing that we can do is the complete opposite, try the cold. So if it's during the winter months, which we see a higher prevalence of croup within these kids within the, the winter months because of the viral infections. Like we said, it's usually caused by the influenza, but it can be caused by other viral infections as well. That kind of causes their upper airway to kind of go into distress. What we can do is bring them outside in the middle of the night in the extreme cold temperatures. So that cold can help kind of um, stop things from spasming and get them out of that respiratory distress. But if these don't progress, if the symptoms don't resolve or if they worsen um, over time, and when I say time, time is really kind of of the essence here because we're not gonna give them hours. Um, we wanna see how long it takes for them to come out of these symptoms, then we're gonna wanna bring them to the ER for treatment. Um, so we want to, when, when they come to the ER, um, we want to plan to administer a cool mist air nebulizer that has the combination of corticosteroid um, in it or a racemic epinephrine in it to help reduce the inflammation and produce that bronchodilation to help open up that airway. Then once we've administered this, and you guys need to know that, that's really like a, an important key that I want to tell you guys. Once we've administered um, the nebulizer, we're going to proceed with oxygen as needed and IV fluids or oral rehydration therapy. Okay, so it's not going to be automatically IV fluids. If the child can take fluids and they're willing to take fluids and they're taking adequate, then we can do some oral rehydration therapy. But we need to get fluids on board as well. Then what we're going to do to monitor is we're going to assess the respiratory system, O2 sets, vital signs, and strict eyes and O's with these guys. All right, epiglottitis. This is one of the most serious of the upper respiratory tract disorders. If you're not scared from the the uh, the the crowing sounds and the inspiratory strider, well, wait till you see epiglottitis. Um, this is actually the most serious. And upon assessment, I want you to think of the um, the four D's: drooling, dysphagia, dysphonia, and distressed inspirations. Okay, so you're going to see, think about the four D's on assessment with this. Um, the child's going to be drooling, dysphagia, they're going to have difficulty um, swallowing, um, dysphonia, they're going to have difficulty speaking, they may sound a little funny, and distressed inspirations, okay, so specifically with that strider, okay. So anytime you see this, those four D's, as well as with infants is sitting in kind of a tripod position. Um, you know the tripod position that we 
think of with our COPDers when they put their elbows on the bedside table, and this helps to kind of expand their lungs. You're gonna see the same with the infants um, sitting on their butt with their two hands, kind of like with their tongue out and drooling. Um, anytime you see that, you wanna be alarmed. Um, one of the last things we wanna do is attempt to visualize the epiglottitis, okay? So a common thing that a parent might wanna do is say, oh, open up, let me see inside your mouth, especially those nurse parents, right? But what you need to know if you ever suspect an epiglottitis, or if you know you work in the PZR or you work in a pediatrics office and you're educating about this, do not attempt to visualize the epiglot epiglottis with a tongue depressor or obtain a throat culture. Do not obtain a throat culture. Don't be um, proactive in getting a culture if you ever suspect the epiglottitis, okay? Don't do that unless you have a trach or an ET tube, um, ET setup nearby, all right? Because this can cause... What, we, what they have is a severe obstruction to a complete obstruction here, okay? Um, so what you wanna do, some therapeutic management within this while we're waiting to, for the child to be seen here, keep the, chi the child calm, um, prevent them from crying, get an IV initiated and monitor their respiratory status. I don't have anything really on this slide to talk about other than I just wanted to show you that in your pilotary, um, table 45, 40.5, has the comparison between the croup and epiglottitis because they can kind of uh, resemble each other and they're two very different treatment regimens. Um, so I like the con contrasting information, the comparison and the contrast between the croup and the epiglottitis. So I do want you to just kind of read through that. All right, now we're gonna move on to the lower respiratory tract disorders. Um, here we're going to talk um, on this slide about BPD, um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, um, a little bit of cystic fibrosis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and asthma. So let's start with our BPD, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Um, this is a, a chronic respiratory disorder that's often seen in preemies. So those of you guys that already work in NICU um, or are interested in, in working in NICU when you graduate, you're going to want to become familiar with um, this disorder um, because it's chronically seen specifically within our preemie population. And it's frequently found um, in preterm infants who received uh, intense mechanical ventilation at birth. And it's thought to occur from a combination of surfactant deficiency and O2 toxicity. So think about it, when babies are born prematurely, they lack that surfactant right? We want that LS ratio to be two to one. They don't have that. So they're born with that surfactant deficiency, which is making it difficult for them to breathe. So what do we do? We heavily um, oxygenate them, um, mechanical intubation, and we blast them with the NRPO2 at birth to get them to breathe, which causes some toxicity. So what happens is as these inflamed surfaces heal, the infant is left with fibrotic scarring, which is the dysplasia, okay? So on assessment, what we see is increased work of breathing and the use of those accessory muscles. We're also gonna see signs of um, cyanosis. So we're gonna see the sarcomoral cyanosis and cyanosis of the nail beds. We're gonna see some retractions, the intercostals and the substernal retractions, as well as the nasal flaring, right? All those signs and symptoms of respiratory distress that we talked about with the newborn. So how we wanna treat this, think of the acronym INSURE, I-N-S-U-R-E. Don't confuse that with the INSURE drinks that our elderly patients drink. This is I-N-S-U-R-E, INSURE. Intubate, surfactant, extubate. So we're gonna intubate them, get them some surfactant, get the tube out, extubate them. So feedings and activity intolerance makes them really prone to a malnutrition, resulting in a lack of growth and development or arrested growth and development, okay? So we need to be sure with these patients that we're clustering care and kind of having a hands-off approach as much as possible because of the intolerant to feedings and activity, making them lack those milestones or achieve those milestones. Um, so clustering our care 
and kind of a hands-off approach to help prevent that fatigue is what we're going to be focusing on when the babies when they're readmitted or we're dealing with the BPD with them. All right, cystic fibrosis. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody's aware of the cystic fibrosis at this point. I think we touched on it when, with adults um, in nursing three. Um, what this is, is this autosomal recessive gene um, trait, which means that there's two mutated genes, one from each parent, okay? So it's an autosomal recessive disorder of the exocrine glands marked by an increased mucus production and a decreased pancreatic enzyme production. So they have an increase in their mucus production and a decrease in the pancreatic enzyme production, which, which um, gives them the inability to break down fats. Deletion of the chromosome seven and an absence of the gene decreases the chloride ion and water transport at the cellular level. So this affects multiple organs, and one of the most common causes of childhood death is this cystic fibrosis, okay? So it's this kind of twofold. We're going to see two different effects within the systems. I know this is part of a, the respiratory system because when we think of ABCs, right, we worry about the airway, breathing, circulation. This is definitely an airway and breathing issue. It also has some GI digestive effects on it as well. So we are battling with two different systems here. So the respiratory effects that this has on the, the pediatric client, they have excess mucus production in their lungs. This not only leads to them having difficulty breathing and respiratory failure, but it also leads to secondary bacterial infections because that's just a Petri dish um, of harboring organisms, okay? So these secondary bacterial infections leads to chronic infections, which then can lead to the respiratory failure, okay? The digestive effects that it has on them, they have thick mucus in their pancreatic ducts, which blocks the enzymes that are responsible for digestion, okay? So upon assessment with these kids overall, you wanna look at a history of recurrent respiratory infections. So making sure that we're getting an accurate history of any recurrent respiratory infections, upper respiratory, lower respiratory infections, and also look at the eating behaviors of the kids, okay? Ch the children can have a voracious appetite from lost nutrients in the undigested food. They're unable to digest these foods, so they're not getting nourished. So they have kind of this voracious appetite. We also want to look at the stool history with them. We want to look at the stool pattern, okay? Um, they're going to have the malabsorption and they're going to have bulky and fatty stools or what we call steatorrhea, okay? And then parents can also report a salty taste on the child's skin. So I know we talk a little bit about the sweat test, but parents may say my child tastes a little bit salty. So what we can do to diagnose this um, is we've got the prenatal DNA testing. So this is included in that those prenatal labs that I talk, we talked about when, when parents, um, when moms are pregnant and they give them that script for a whole bunch of labs for that first seven to eight week, this is included in that testing, in the prenatal DNA testing, because we're testing for um, the, the, this autosomal recessive, um, the genes, seeing if they're a carrier. Um, but also, we do the newborn screening and we look at their clinical symptoms. So the newborn screening, remember I talked about the PKU testing um, where we test the phenylalanine and the lack of the enzyme there that's needed to break down the phenylalanine. And then we also test for the um, congenital or newborn screening. This is part of it as well. Um, but then we look at the clinical symptoms also. So we look at the recurrent upper respiratory infections and we look at the stool pattern or their appetite, okay? We can also do what's called the sweat chloride test, um, where they test for the chloride levels within their sweat. And what we're going to see is about two to five times normal um, level of sodium and chloride that's found in their sweat. Two to five times higher than the normal level of sodium and chloride found in their sweat. Also, we're going to do some PFTs, pulmonary function tests, and minimally, get a minimally invasive chest x-ray, okay? 
what we're going to do for therapeutic management, um, respiratory, the aerosolized inhalers, which is going to help promote airway clearance. And also we can administer the Dornase Alpha, um, which is a genetically engineered pulmonary enzyme, which is going to be um, given to help thin the mucus and also improve the lung function. What we can give them digestively as therapeutic management, fat soluble vitamin supplementation. So we wanna put them on some fat soluble vitamins. Um, we wanna increase the protein in their diet and give them high calorie foods, high calorie healthy foods, okay? And we wanna make sure that we administer the pancreatic enzymes. Remember, they, they, those pancreatic enzyme ducts are blocked. So this is effective only for about 45 to 60 minutes after mm -hmm. administration, okay? So you, these must be given at the start of a meal or snack to help promote the digestion and absorb those vitamins. All right, so we have a small window of opportunity to administer um, these pancreatic enzymes, which is only gonna be effective for about 45 to 60 minutes after administration. So you need to be sure that we're giving those timely at the time of eating at the meals or a snack as well, okay? To help promote digestion and absorb those vitamins. So some nursing interventions with cystic fibrosis, we wanna maintain a patent airway good pulmonary hygiene, right? So another, what, what I call pulmonary toileting, coughing, deep breathing, incentive spirometer, um, get them moving around, and the chest percussion, right? Chest PT, postural drainage, vibration, percussion, um, respiratory therapy is gonna be our best friends um, when, we, when we're taking care of the CF patients, okay? Um, oscillating vest, so we may be putting the oscillating vest on the children. Antihistamines are actually contraindicated. You would think we want to administer antihistamines to help dry up that mucus secretion. But the problem is it's not that they're, it's not that we want to dry it up. It's the problem is they can't expectorate it, right? They can't expel it. Um, so antihistamines are contraindicated because they have a drying effect, making it difficult to expectorate the mucus. We want to get rid of the mucus with these kids, okay? Drying it up is not going to help them. Bronchitis, bronchiolitis, this is acute inflammation causing wheezing, most often triggered by either a virus or a bacteria. Could be specifically like the RSV, which is now, I can say this spring, more prevalent than it was last spring, right? We're seeing a high prevalence of the RSV. So this is acute inflammation um, causing wheezing, most often triggered by a virus or bacteria, more commonly the RSV, also adenovirus, and influenza. So the bacteria, um, the RSV, adenovirus, and the influenza um, causes the bronchiolitis, inflammation in the small, the bronchioles, as well as the major bronchi. So how we treat this is supportive care. We treat the symptoms, right? Give them some IV fluids, oxygen, um, administer an antiviral for RSV, such as polivizumab, poliv um, and monoclonal antibodies that are used for the prophylactic RSV in preemies. Okay, so this is something that's given, these injections are given monthly for five months. So insurances are, they approve this, um, this antiviral, the Pelivizumab, I can never say that ever, not even on screen recording. So we wanna be, it, we wanna be administering this, the injections times, um, for five months, okay? And it's given prophylactically, especially in the preemie population um, for the RSV in these preemie babies because they're so at risk for um, developing the bronchitis and the bronchiolitis later on and down the road. Asthma, so we all know asthma, all right? We know about asthma with adults. This is a chronic obstructive inflammatory disorder caused by the hyper-responsiveness of the airways, right? Um, primarily the smaller airways um, with our, our kids here. Uh, also caused by airway edema, narrowing, and also the mucus production. Um, Pete's asthma triggers are the same as adults, right? Allergies, cold, air, uh, smoke, 
viral infections, stress, pet dander, exercise, right? But we see a high prevalence of asthma in food allergic children, okay? So eggs and tree nuts are our most common allergies that cause the asthma um, within our peds kids. So what we see with, with um, on assessment with asthma, these, these kids, the infants, um, are head bobbers. So their infants' heads may bob when they're in respiratory distress. Remember I said they have a very short airway. They don't have necks. Little babies, they, they don't have any necks, right? Your newborns don't have any necks. So how you know that they're in respiratory distress is they have this like little head bobbing. So you're gonna be looking for that, especially if you're working on a peds unit or PICU. Um, and we're also looking for the status asthmaticus, right? Which is when they fail to respond to the first line therapy. Um, so how we wanna treat them is with quick relief SABAs, the SABAs, corticosteroids, and anticholinergic, okay? Um, Long-term control is the ICSs, the intermediate, and then the long-acting betas, okay? We also can give them the leukotriene modifiers and the mast cell inhibitors, especially for your allergic reactions that trigger the um, status asthmaticus. So what we wanna do when it comes to asthma is a lot of education, right? A ton of education. If you guys remember back when I did my growth and development lecture and for the school age child, the, the, we saw a video of the nurse teaching the child how to use the inhaler. And another one too, they were teaching the child how to use the nebulizer. A lot of this is education. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're educating on the correct use of the MDIs and the arrow chambers, okay? Proper use. If they're not using it correctly, we can just toss it out the window. It's a waste of everyone's time and it's a waste of resources and you're not treating the problem. So it's also um, not only with devices, we wanna teach them on the importance of using the meds as prescribed. So take your regularly preventative meds, like your allergy meds, even if they're symptom free, okay? And we want them to avoid using the overuse of the SABAs, which are the quick relief, short acting betas, right? We want to avoid the overuse of that. Those are for the quick relief. That's the first line of treatment, okay? So that's your albuterol, albuterol terbutaline, um, your quick relief meds. We don't want them to overuse those. All right, this slide also um, comes from your pillitary, and this is table 40.1. This has a little um, comparison of bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and asthma, um, because it can kind of all resemble a little bit of the, you know, disorders of the lower respiratory tract. So it's good to take a look at um, this slide in comparing the bronchiolitis, um, which you may see kids, you know, admitted onto the D7C7 unit with the bronchiolitis. We see a lot of that versus pneumonia versus asthma. So go ahead and read through this chart. Make sure you guys pay attention to this chart. All right, so now that we have a good understanding of pathophysiology of all the different upper and lower respiratory tract disorders, now let's apply the nursing process to said nursing uh, respiratory disorder. So ADPI, right? Assessment, diagnosis, outcome, implementation, evaluation. We already talked about the assessment, right? We talked about what we're going to assess for, how the patients are gonna present with each upper and lower respiratory tract. So we want to be assessing for significant and correlating manifestations. Know what to look for when we're suspecting a certain disorder, okay? We need to be sure that we're auscultating and visualizing that chest. So it's not enough just to listen. We need to be putting eyes on it as well. We're looking for the seesaw breathing. We're looking for substernal intercostal retractions. We're looking at any nasal flaring, right? We're looking at their work of breathing. Are they using any accessory muscles? And um, we're looking at the color of the skin and the membranes, right? The mucous membranes, the skin. Um, we're gonna be measuring that chest circumference, um, the chest diameter. We're looking at the AP diameter. Um, we're also looking at the diagnostic tests. So think about all the diagnostic tests that correlate with each of the diseases and disorders. So ABGs, chest x-rays, um, CT scans, ultrasounds, right? Bronchoscopy, that's going to be a possible diagnostic test that you're prepping them for. Um, remember our nasal and our throat swabs. Have those ready for when we need them, when we need to get them drawn. Know when you shouldn't be taking throat swabs, right? 
sputum cultures, right? Goes, it's the same, same thing as it is with the adults, making sure that we're getting that sputum culture um, as well as looking at their O2 sets, okay? And then once we do that, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. So I know I kind of already um, talked about this on the last slide. On physical assessment, we're looking at their cough. Remember cough. And remember we taught this to you guys in nursing two. And I know this because I used to teach it in nursing three and we moved it to two. One of the first symptoms of respiratory disease in adults is that cough. So it's so important. You know, we have it in the critical criteria of assessing for the presence of a cough. It's the same with the kids. You know, it, it may not. With the kids, it's going to be a little bit more obvious. Um, you know, they're they're not going to be able to kind of suppress that reflex like we, we can as adults, which is why as when we're taking care of adults, we really want to fish that information out of them. Um, whereas with the kids, they come in, they're hacking and coughing everywhere, right? Um, but you want to really look at the proximal coughing, okay? So coughing, it, it, are they having it more nocturnally? Is it more so at night? Or during the day, does it get worse with activity? Um, or is it kind of constant? What triggers it? And then we also want to look at everything else, the rate, the depth of the respirations, right? We want to get an accurate respiratory rate, especially when we're looking at the respiratory distress, and especially when we're looking at our neonates and our newborns. We look at the retractions. We also look at the restlessness, okay? So like I said, I say all the time in the newborn nursery, the baby can't raise their hand and say, you know what, I'm having a little bit of difficulty breathing over here. I think I might be dropping my O2 sets. No, they get restless. You see, when you see that little burrito moving around, like thrashing, you know they're unable to breathe, whether they have an occluded airway because of mucus or vomit, or they're having respiratory distress. They're going to be restless. Um, you're going to see the cyanosis. Within your chronicers, like your preemies, you may see the clubbing of the fingers. We look at the chest diameter. We talked all about this already, um, as well as the labs and the diagnostics. All right, so sites of respiratory retractions. This is just a nice little illustration of um, the respiratory re uh, retractions, where you're going to see it. I know I said I'm always looking at for the substernal retractions right here and there. Substernum is... is where you can see the babies, especially with, um, I say babies, but the kids with croup, you're going to see it right there, as well as those newborns when they're starting their little pathway towards respiratory distress. Um, most commonly, we're going to see these substernal retractions. But also another air, um, site of the respiratory retractions is we can see it suprasternal right up here, suprasternal, the supraclavicular, you know, the clavicle, um, and then your subcostal or intercostal spaces here. All right, so now the, let's talk about the nursing diagnosis. I know we're, we're making our way through this nursing process. So what would be some applicable nursing diagnoses for the kids that have these respiratory illnesses um, or disorders? Activity intolerance. We heard a lot about that, right? Um, so having an activity intolerance, what can we do for them? Short, frequent feeds, cluster care, right? Um, all of your basic concepts. Um, fatigue. So allow for breaks. Allow for them um, to have the breaks when they do feel fatigued. Um, fear, you know, fear is real to kids like it is real to adults. So it can be very scary when they have these bouts of croup or these bouts if they went through an epiglottitis episode. It can be very traumatic to them. But acknowledge that fear. So offer self. Think about all the therapeutic techniques we can do. Therapeutic communication is going to go a long way with not only the patient but the family. Um, allowing them to verbalize their feelings and to express their fear. Okay. And think back on all the time. Um, think back on our growth and development lecture when I talked about therapeutic play. Um, that was another way for them to express their fears if they can't express it in terms, in vocabulary, we can give them um, other means, other tools to help express that. Obviously, the impaired gas exchange, right? Um, monitor for O2 stats, do our respiratory assessments, monitor for that gas exchange. Impaired social interaction. So if the child is on, um, if they're on trend, um, if they're on social isolation precautions, um, whether it's droplet, um, airborne, or even contact, um, you know, they're going to have an impaired social interaction, but also if they're hospitalized, frequent hospitalizations, right? Depending on the age of the pediatric client, 
they're having an impaired social interaction by being hospitalized. So this is really where our child life specialist is gonna become our best friend um, when we're thinking in terms of those, that growth and development and that psychosocial or socialization aspect. Uh, impaired breathing, ineffective breathing pattern, right? This is another obvious one as well as the impaired guess exchange. And then deficient knowledge. Deficient knowledge applies to everything everything including our diagnoses for respiratory so what do we do for this teach 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 all right cusin y'all heard of cusin before i know this because i we talked about this in my nursing three lectures so it's the framework quality and safety education for nurses so what are some cusin cusin initiatives um for dealing for a client with respiratory illnesses, right? Patient-centered care. We're gonna, we should be providing patient-centered care for everybody, right? That we, we develop the plan of care based around the patient, not around the disease, not around the disorder, okay? So making sure that we have an individualized patient's care plan and meeting the needs of not only that patient, which is our pediatric patient, but the family also, right? Because it can be like a fam it's a family unit. Teamwork and collaboration. Think about all the resources at our fingertips and who we're going to be, we're going to need to collaborate with on some of these disorders, caring for these patients with the disorders. So respiratory therapy, right? Pulmonology, um, child life specialist, um, evidence-based practice. This is making sure that we're using our current guidelines, making sure that we're staying up to date and we've got utilizing current practice, which is ever changing, ever so fast. Um, so making sure that we're utilizing our um, current guidelines when dealing with these respiratory illnesses and the hospitalization. Quality improvement. This is our preventing and tracking errors, okay? And then safety and informatics, I think, is pretty um, self-explanatory. All right. Lastly, well, two more, two more slides when it comes to respiratory. I just want to talk a little bit about therapeutic techniques when it comes to dealing with... Um, the kids that have these respiratory disorders and illnesses. Um, so therapy to improve oxygenation, obviously that is our main goal, that's our main focus. So oxygen administration, knowing pharmacological therapy, um, you know, if you've had me in clinical or you know me, you know I always base all of my interventions and my, um, my implications, I always base it on non-farm and farm right? This is definitely where you want to be thinking about what is our pharmacological therapy or pharmacological treatment. So our meter dose inhalers, right? Um, the SABAs, the LABAs, um, when we're looking at the allergies, um, knowing the digestive drugs, the pancreatic enzymes for cystic fibrosis, um, knowing what aerosolized um, humidification that we give for, um, you know, the kids with croup, with bronchodysplasia, um, and as well as non-pharmacologic. Um, so O2 administration, incentive spirometer, um, coughing and deep breathing, pulmonary, um, incentive spirometer, I'm sorry, um, chest PT, chest percussion, using the oscillating vest, especially for your um, cystic fibrosis kids, right? But they also re may require a tracheostomy, okay? So you may be caring for a, a kid that has a tracheostomy or that required a tracheostomy mm -hmm. because of this um, illness or disorder, okay? So making sure that we're suctioning um, according to current practice. Um, they may need ventilation for some of your kids that are in the PICU and the NICU. So assisted ventilation, being able to monitor that. And they may be a candidate for a lung, transplant, lung transplantation, especially with your cystic fibrosis kids, okay? So just making sure that we know what are some of these therapeutic techniques, um, hum humidified O2, right? Chest physiotherapy, um, the mucus clearing devices, coughing, inhalation devices. Um, this is a, a pretty good slide that summarizes the therapeutic techniques with the kid with respiratory disorders. And really quick on this slide, I talked a little bit about bronchial drainage, um, especially with your cystic fibrosis kids. Um, you know, the goal for them isn't, it's, we can't, we shouldn't be given the antihistamines. The goal for them is expectorate, remove the mucus. We want to be removing the mucus to help clear those airways. So what we do is postural drainage, postural um, bronchial drainage. We need to put the kids in this position. 
okay? So this is also right out of your textbook. I don't know the table, um, but these are just some pictures of positions that are suggested for bronchial drainage. Once we do the chest PT or the oscillating vest, or um, they have the little devices that are like little suctions um, for percussion, then we want to help drain, right? We mobilize all those fluids and mucus. Now it's got to come, we, we turn them so that it drains out. All right, so here's your NCLEX question. When assessing a child for cyanosis, which is important for the nurse to remember? A, cyanosis is an early indicator of respiratory distress. B, the degree of cyanosis is not an accurate indicator of the, de the degree of hypoxia. C, cyanosis is caused by a decrease in the depth of respirations. Or D, um, cyanosis will be present if the child has a large loss of blood volume. The correct answer, if I had my poll everywhere, everybody would be getting this right. And the correct answer is going to be B, right? The degree of cyanosis is not an accurate indicator of the degree of hypoxia. So the rationale, if the hemoglobin is low, where we have a decreased number of red blood cells, there may not be much cyanosis as the red blood cells, which when not completely oxygenated, are what gives the blood the dark color. So cyanosis is present with a, PA, a, a PO2 of less than 40, which is usually a later sign in respiratory distress. Okay, which is the primary nursing responsibility when a four-year-old child with a tracheostomy tube eats? All right, primary nursing responsibility for a four-year-old with a trach tube. A, prevent aspiration of food or fluids into the tube. B, limit ingestion of too much fluid. C, foster smooth passage of foods through the tube opening. Or D, prevent dyspnea from eating too rapidly. The correct answer is going to be A, prevent aspiration of foods or fluids into the tube, right? Because preschoolers, your four-year-old, are not necessarily neat eaters, we as the nurse are going to want to be protecting that tube from any food or fluids entering it, which can cause aspiration. All right, last question. A child is to use an incentive spirometer four times daily, which statement suggests that the child understands the purpose and correct technique of the procedure. A, to do this right, I will take in a very deep breath. B, using this will help me cough less. C, the harder I blow out, the better I am doing. Or D, this will make more room for my heart in my chest. So the correct answer is going to be A. To do this right, I will take in a very deep breath. Um, the purpose of the incentive spirometer, which you all know this by now because it's been two years since we've been beating this into your head, is to make the patient or the child take a deep breath to aerate the lungs better. We want to inspiration.